Let me start recording and share these files with y'all. All right, where we left off was I think 50 or six slides, 69 or 59. And we just got done talking about EPSPs and IPSPs. Okay. And yeah, I think we're on slide 59. Okay. All right, let me turn this thing on. So, okay. So, just a quick rehash about EPSPs and IPSPs. All right. Those are what we call graded potentials. Graded potentials only occur, all right, in the receptive segment of the neuron. The receptive segment includes, all right, cell body and the dendrites. And in addition to having the leak channels there, the sodium potassium ion pumps, you have another channel there. That is a chemically gated channel. Right? So that can include chemically gated sodium channels, chemically gated potassium channels, chemically gated chloride channels. Right? So our whole goal is that eventually you want, to, you want to create an action potential. That can only happen, that can only start in the initial segment. We have to get to our threshold value. Does anyone remember what threshold value is? That's right, negative 55. Okay? So normally our resting membrane potential is at negative 70. So we need to get it to negative 55. So that's a difference of 15 millivolts. So our goal is to generate enough what we call EPSPs, the excitatory postsynaptic potential. Okay? We have to generate enough, we have to make it strong enough to get that value down to negative 55 millivolts. Right? In the meantime, you can have IPSPs, which are inhibitory postsynaptic potentials. Right? So what those are, well, first of all, they backtrack. Graded potentials are many versions of an action potential. I don't really like to compare the two, but they're one short-lived, right? And they're local. They don't travel very far. Right? It's like, like I said, that analogy where you throw the stone into the pond. The ripples start to go away from where you threw the stone in, but they get weaker and weaker and weaker and further away from where you threw it in. Take the synaptic knob from the presynaptic neuron, okay, because they're going to start to create the, the uh, great potentials there. Okay, it's going to be stronger, strongest there, and then it'll eventually get weaker and weaker and further away. The, the, the great potentials encounter resistance, right? But our goal is to get to the initial segment. We've got to get our signals to the initial segment, right? for our action potential to be generated. So this term that we came up with, summation, is when we add up all the EPSPs and all the IPSPs, okay? Because one EPSP and one IPSP will basically kind of cancel each other out. Kind of think of it like that, all right? But it's not completely the same, but in general, okay? So we need, if we're going to generate, right, an action potentials, we need more EPSPs or stronger EPSPs than the IPSPs to still get that value. Our resting membrane potential, which is negative 70, we need to get that value to our threshold value, which is negative 55. Okay? So we're going to add up all the voltage changes that occur. Okay? So EPSPs will make the inside of the cell all right, less negative. Okay. While IPSPs make the inside of the cell more negative. Okay. We're going to add all those up and hopefully it'll be enough to get to our negative 55 all right, threshold value. It'll be a difference of a positive 15 millivolts. Okay. We add up all those different voltage changes from the dendrites and the cell body. Okay. And our goal is to get to that threshold value of negative 55. So we call this the threshold membrane potential. Okay. So when we so if we get if we get to that value, all right, that's great. Now we initiate an action potential. Let's say we get to a negative 56 or negative 57. That's sub threshold. Don't initiate an action potential, unfortunately. We're close, but it's sub-threshold, okay? So this is the minimum, all right, change that we need, that 15 millivolt change, all right, to reach our threshold. 
So you will need several or multiple EPSPs right, generated. Not only that, they have to reach the axon hillock. Okay? They need to get there. They need to be strong enough all right, to get to that threshold value of negative 55 millivolts. Okay? All right. So when that happens, when we reach that negative 55 millivolt value, right, and we get to that threshold, then we open up voltage gated channels. And guess what? We make an action potential. Because action potentials, and we'll talk about it, they're all or none. Look at that row of dominoes. And you push that first domino, right, they all fall down. That's what happens with voltage gated, uh, voltage -gated channels. Right? Once the first one opens up and the axon hillock in the initial segment, you can sit back and just watch that action potential, that nerve signal just ride on down the axon. Right? That's what we'll, we'll see. We just need to get to that first one. And that's why we need to get all right, our, our, the, 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 the sum of all of our graded potentials. And that sum needs to be a plus 15 millivolts. Okay, going back to math, right? Plus 15 millivolts added to negative 70 millivolts equals negative 55. Right? That's what we need to do. Okay? That's our goal. That's our end game. Okay? So there's two types of summation that we're going to discuss. Okay? There's spatial and there's temporal. Okay? So the spatial, think of space. Right? That means you're going to have multiple locations all throughout the receptive segment. That includes dendrites and the soma. And so they're going to be at simultaneously receiving neurotransmitters from different neurons. Okay? But you need to know they're from multiple locations. Okay? So the presynaptic neurons all right, from different areas are going to be all right, releasing their neurotransmitter simultaneously onto the receptive segment, okay? And it's going to generate those graded potentials, those postsynaptic potentials. And hopefully, it'll be enough EPSPs okay, to initiate our action potential. <clears throat> Keep in mind, and I know I talked about this last class, that simultaneously, you'll have some neurons that are going to be generating EPSPs. You're going to have some other neurons generating IPSPs. Sometimes it's good to inhibit a neuron, okay? You want to inhibit a neuron in certain situations, excuse me, like certain reflexes, okay, which we'll talk about, all right? The other type of summation is temporal. This is when you have one single presynaptic neuron, okay? And it's just releasing constantly, repeatedly, all right, our neurotransmitter, one spot. This is just blasting all right, that plasma membrane right in the gates there, the chemically gated uh, channels there with its neurotransmitter. And it keeps doing it over a specific period of time, but it creates multiple EPSPs like we said before. Again, we need to make sure that it's enough to reach threshold value. Okay? So you need to know the difference between the two. Spatial is multiple presynaptic neurons are releasing their neurotransmitter simultaneously, and then temporal is just one. It just keeps bombarding the plasma membrane or the cell membrane there of the cell, of the receptor segment. Okay. I'll show you a picture here, I got two. Here's the spatial summation, so we can see all these different, all right, presynaptic neurons, and they're all releasing their neurotransmitters. Now, if you see, the, the red are gonna be the IPSPs, okay? And the green are gonna be the EPSPs. So they're all individually, all right, but at the same time, releasing their neurotransmitter, okay, EPSPs and IPSPs will cancel each other out. And you can see right, from our little graphs here, you can see some are stimulating and some are inhibiting, okay? So some are moving us closer to our negative 55 threshold value, and some are moving us away. So this row here, these are IPSPs. So we're dropping our membrane potential more negative. These are EPSPs. They're making our membrane potential more positive. Okay? We just add them all up. If we get to that 
pile, or excuse me, if we get to that negative 55 threshold value here in the axon hillock, boom, we got ourselves, um, we got ourselves action potential. Okay. So here you can see, all right, what it looks like when we're talking about spatial summation right here with a bunch of EPSPs. Okay, so one, there's what, five, five different presynaptic neurons. So they're firing all at once and they build up a little bit more each time, it makes it a little bit stronger, makes it a little bit stronger. Once we hit negative 75 or 55, bam. All right, our first voltage gated channel opens up and our membrane potential goes into the positives. Okay. Here's our temporal summation, all right? In this situation, all right, you've got one single neuron or presynaptic neuron. It's just repeatedly, repeatedly just releasing, all right, its neurotransmitter. Okay, same thing. You can see up here, these are EPSPs. Down here, these are IPSPs. We're moving away. I'll show you this picture here, okay? It's one little lonely, makes me think of a Beastie Boys song. One beastie, no, one lonely beastie I be all by myself without nobody. The sun is beating down on my baseball hat. Can anyone name the song? Paul Revere, 1984, License to Ill. Oh. All right. Anyways, you can see one presynaptic neuron here is repeatedly releasing its neurotransmitter, bombarding that dendrite, and it's enough, hopefully, to change our plasma membrane potential here to negative five, and then it takes off, boom, All right? Okay, now we're gonna get into some more interesting stuff here. Now we're into the axon. And now we're gonna learn about the action potential, All right? So the first two classes, I was setting the table, trying to um, get us ready to learn about this action potential. And so the action potential obeys this concept called the all or none law, okay? So that means, once you start the action potential, you don't stop. It's going to happen, okay? It's going to travel all the way down the entire length of the axon. And where it's different from a graded potential, the graded potentials were short-lived, okay? Well, action potentials aren't because they're going to go down the entire length of the axon, right? And as um, graded potentials uh, travel, along the plasma membrane, it became weaker and weaker. Well, guess what? Action potentials don't. They do not lose any intensity, okay? We'll talk about that. So as long as we reach our threshold value, okay, we'll get an action potential. If we don't, like I said, we call that sub-threshold, okay? And we do not open up any of our voltage-gated channels in our initial segment, okay? All right, so you give the example, this is similar to uh, firing a gun, okay? When you pull the trigger, okay, you fire the bullet out, right? Now, regardless of, uh, uh, of once that bullet's fired, you're not stopping it, okay? So if you pull the trigger enough, okay, you give it enough, an, enough pressure on that trigger, you'll fire the gun. If you don't, if it's insufficient, right, that's our kind of like our sub-threshold value, right, then the gun won't fire, okay? So it doesn't matter if you pull the trigger hard or if you pull it fast. Once you pull the trigger and the bullet fires, all right, that's the same thing with an action potential, okay? You cannot change the intensity of an action potential no matter what, okay? It's going to have the same intensity the whole time, okay? Nothing can make it speed up or become stronger. Okay. <clears throat> all or none. The dominoes. Push the first one down, they all fall down. Okay. What is the significance of threshold membrane potential in the initial segment of a neuron? Okay. If we reach that threshold membrane potential, we get an action potential. If we don't, all right, we do not get an action potential. The sub threshold, okay? That's simple, okay? Our value is again negative 55. All right, let's talk about the actual axon, all right? 
This is where we're going to talk about what gates open, what gates don't. All right, so first of all, when we're dealing with the axon, we're primarily going to be talking about the plasma membrane, the axial lemma here. Right? That is going to be what conducts our action potential. Okay? So there are certain steps involved in an action potential. The first step is depolarization. Okay? Depolarization is when we make the inside of the cell less negative. And that comes from all right, sodium entering the cell. Okay? Remember, sodium is positive. Okay, so when sodium enters the cell, it brings its positive charge with it, and it makes the inside of the cell more positive, or you could also say less negative. How does it do that? Right, the voltage-gated sodium channels open up. Okay, so voltage mean or voltage-gated means that's the stimulus that we need to open up that channel. All right, remember, and our voltage is going to be that charge across the plasma membrane. Resting membrane potential is negative 70. Once we get to negative 55, that's our voltage, right? That difference, that change in the voltage there of negative 55 will then cause our first sodium, excuse me, our first voltage-gated sodium channel to open up. And when it does, now we're gonna see some, some really cool stuff happening, okay? All right. So the next phenomena, all right, is repolarization, okay? So if you remember, repolarization is returning back to our resting membrane potential, okay? So now we made the inside of the cell more positive, right? but now we wanna make it back to our negative 70 millivolts, okay? So to do that, we wanna get back to that negative potential value, right? We need to make the inside of the cell less positive okay so we got to get rid of a positive charge somehow well how do we do that well, we open up our sorry y'all i should have silenced that um we should have um we open up our voltage gated potassium channel so they open up the potassium leaves the inside of the cell but it takes its positive charge with it making the inside of the cell more negative so right now right for an action potential in the conductive segment, our axon, right, when we're talking about depolarization and repolarization, we're dealing with voltage-gated channels, okay? Memorize this. Depolarization, all right? Is this, is this something that we have learned or a different spot? But no, no, no. You have, Stacey, you have learned this. And it's the same, it's what we talked about last class. Same situation. Last class, I just... Gave you the general, yep, yep. I, I gave you the, just the general definition of what depolarization is. But now I'm getting into the specifics and how it applies to the axon. Okay, so yep, you got it. Because we saw we saw depolarization in the receptive segment when we were dealing with EPSPs and IPSPs. Did they call you? They tried my phone, but they must have called you. <laughs> um, okay, so we saw that in the in the receptive segment. Okay, so. Now we're going to apply it here to the conductive segment. All right. So once this occurs, all right, we're going to have our action, and this is going to happen the whole length of the axon. Right. That's how we propagate, all right, our action potential all the way down to what we call right the transmissive segment. That's the synaptic knob. Okay. So it involves voltage-gated channels. Okay. So when we talk about that. The opening of those voltage gated channels and the progression of that act potential moving down the, the axon, we call that a nerve signal. You hear me use kind of interchange those terms nerve signal, act potential. Okay. All right. So now we're going to get real, real in depth. And what I mean by that is I'm going to break it down step by step. A lot of this you guys kind of already know. Now we're going to put it into, into practice here. Okay. So I'm going to explain all right, how depolarization occurs in the conductive segment specifically. I'm going to even zoom in here. We can only focus on one at a time. Okay. Well, actually, I should have done that. I need the pictures. All right. Okay. 
So step by step, first step, resting membrane potential, right? Negative 70, know what's going on. Our leak channels are open. Sodium potassium ion pumps are going in full effect, maintaining that negative 70. What are our gated channels doing, right? Especially our voltage gated channels, because we're in the, um, in the conductive segment, they're closed. Okay, so that's what we're seeing here. All right, let me zoom in. That's what we're seeing here, all right? We're here in our axon, right? The neuron's not doing anything. Our resting membrane potential is at negative 70, okay? So you can see, here's our voltage-gated sodium channel. It's closed. Everything's just copacetic. Nothing's happening, okay? So now, going to step two, okay? So in the initial segment, remember, we opened up our first voltage-gated sodium channel. All right, so sodium starts to flood into the, into the axon hillock, okay? Well, that's what we're referring to as sodium enters from the adjacent region. So sodium is entering into the, into the axon hillock, okay? And you have your first voltage-gated sodium channel in the conductive segment. So from sodium entering in, okay, our resting membrane potential now goes from negative 70 to becoming more positive. It gets to negative 55. So when that happens, our voltage-gated sodium channels open up. So that's what we're seeing here. Okay? So sodium starts to enter into the cell. Okay? It makes the inside of the cell more positive. We hit threshold, and then bang. Our voltage-gated sodium channel opens up, and now sodium will start to pour in, okay? So that's the second step. So far, and we're starting to depolarize our cell here. All right, step three, okay? As sodium enters the axon, it's going to eventually give, all right, enough of it enters in, you can see it here, enough of that sodium enters in, it's going to give our membrane potential a positive value. Okay, eventually, it'll get to positive 30. So that's what we're seeing here. All right? The sodium is entering in the axon, and it's flooding in. It's coming in quite a bit. It's flooding in, and it's going to keep pouring in until we reach plus 30 millivolts. Okay? That'll be the stimulus that causes the voltage-gated sodium channels to close. Okay, so sodium enters in, okay, pours in, it makes the inside of the cell now positive 30, okay? So that leads us to step four. Let me go back to full, because there's a lot of stuff here. All right, so now sodium enters in, and eventually, okay, it will close once we get to that positive 30 value. And not the, not the activation gate, because that activation gate, remember, remember voltage-gated sodium channels have the activation gate and the inactivation gate, okay? So the activation gate is still open, but the inactivation gate temporarily closes, right, once we get to that positive 30 value, okay? So sodium can't enter into the cell anymore, right? So this is going to occur, all right, once this occurs at one channel, all right, it is going to now spread down the axon, okay? Because all this sodium has entered into the cell. And eventually, the next voltage-gated sodium channel will be affected by that adjacent sodium. So that will cause the next voltage-gated sodium channel to open up, okay? So that's what this is talking about, okay? So those first four steps that I just told you, all right, are going to repeat themselves, all right, in the adjacent regions, all right, all the way down to the synaptic knob, okay? Now, here's the thing, and this is very important. You want to make sure that you write this down or underline it or whatever. Voltage-gated sodium channels um, are in the inactivated state. And that's what makes it impossible for the action potential to go anywhere but towards the synaptic knobs because they can't go back up towards the receptive segment 
because the inactivation gate is closed and nothing can cause it to open up. Okay, it's a timing thing. It'll close for a few moments, but those few moments are long enough to prevent that action potential from going backwards. Okay, seen that asked on a test question. Okay? That is the reason why. Okay, and when you're in the inactivated state, that means the inactivated the inactivation gate is closed. Okay, that's a, that's a, a special phenomenon that's only present with voltage gated sodium channels. So the only one with an inactivation gate. Potassium voltage gated potassium channels don't have an inactivation gate. Okay, they just have the one gate. So you need to know that it will not go backwards. All right. So now we depolarize the cell, okay? but now we got to repolarize it. We got to reset everything. Okay? So you know what repolarization is. It's returning our membrane potential back to the resting membrane potential value of negative 70. So that means we need to make the inside of the cell more negative. So what happens? We reach that positive 30 millivolts, voltage gated sodium channels close. And then the potassium, excuse me, the voltage gated potassium channels open up. So potassium now leaves the cell. Where that positive 30 that stimulates the voltage gated potassium channel to open, potassium starts to leave the cell. And then we start to make the inside of the cell more negative, more negative until we get to that negative 70 um, millivolt value. Okay, here's the problem though. All right, once we get to that negative 70 millivolt value, the gates don't always close right away. It might stay open a little bit longer. So a little bit more potassium will leak out. Okay, so instead of stopping at negative 70, we might drop down to negative 75, possibly even negative 80. Well, what definition term did we learn last class? When you become more negative past the resting membrane potential, we call that hyperpolarization, okay? So that's what happens briefly, right? Briefly, your cell will become hyperpolarized, okay? Because those um, voltage-gated potassium channels stay open just a little bit longer. And unfortunately, we overshot our mark, right? So we went to negative 72 or neg negative 78 by accident. Okay, but when they all close then, okay, what will happen, how do we get back to that resting membrane potential? All the gates are closed. How do you think we get back to the resting membrane potential? These guys, sodium potassium ion pumps, okay? Our sodium potassium ion pumps are going to reestablish our resting membrane potential. They're going to pump sodium out all right, and pump potassium into the cell. And that'll get us back to right, our negative 70 millivolts. So on our graph here, that's where this little, this little blip down here, that's the hyperpolarization. Okay? So we've hyperpolarized just briefly, but again, all those, eventually all the voltage-gated potassium channels will be closed. Okay. All our channels will be closed in that area, right? And then the resting membrane potential gets reestablished through the sodium potassium ion pumps. Okay. Cool. Not bad. A little bit. All right. That's repolarization. Okay. So this is the the figure that I tell students to really really memorize if you can. Figure twelve. Um, 0.19. If you can memorize and understand all this stuff here, okay, then you understand, all right, an action potential, okay, because it, it puts everything together and even on this graph. I like pictures. All right, so this is basically explaining to you what I was talking about here, right? So you've got your resting membrane potential negative 70, right? In this second phase here, these are our graded potentials that we're seeing. All right, eventually we hit our threshold value in the initial segment, and bam, now we start to depolarize the neuron. Right? 
And so when you see this huge spike going up, that is when the voltage gated sodium channels open up, right? Then we cause the, the resting membrane, or excuse me, the membrane potential to reach a positive 30 millivolts, right? When we get to that value, the voltage gated sodium channels close, and then our voltage gated potassium channels open, and then potassium leaves the cell, and we start to repolarize our cell. Okay. Once we get to negative 70, all the gates close for the for the voltage gated potassium channels, but they don't do it in time, so we dip down briefly into hyperpolarization. At this point, all the gates are closed, okay, and then our uh, sodium potassium ion pumps right return us back to our resting membrane potential. So I would say, if you can read this and understand it, you're you're, you're in a good start, okay? This kind of rat, uh, explains everything. This one slide, this one picture, all right, explains everything that it takes me about 15 to 20 slides to explain to you guys, all right? So, but if you understand this, you're good. You'll be good, okay? All right. So when we're talking about, this is what I love uh, about depolarization and whatnot when we talk about anesthetics like lidocaine, okay? What they do is they mess with your voltage-gated sodium channels, okay? So if they mess and they uh, inhibit your voltage-gated sodium channels, well, then we can't depolarize the cell, okay? We cannot make the inside of the cell more positive. So essentially that blocks, right, the, cre the formation of that nerve signal or that action potential. So if it's a neuron that transmits sensory information of what we call nociception, which is pain, okay, if we can inactivate that nerve, then you can't feel pain, okay? If it never, see, you only realize pain when the signal gets to your central nervous system, specifically when that signal gets to um, your thalamus. The thalamus is is what we call the relay station in your brain. When it gets to the thalamus, the thalamus will relay that information to a specific part of your brain. And when those signals get to that specific part of the brain, then you'll realize it's pain. It's visual stimuli. It goes to your occipital lobe, and you'll you, you interpret that that the, that nervous signal or information as um, visual uh, vision sight. Okay. Same thing if it goes with hearing. Okay, it has to get to your thalamus. Okay, so if we can block those signals from ever getting into your central nervous system, you won't feel the pain. Okay, that's the nice thing about ice. Okay, ice is nice in regards to how it can numb you. If you've ever sprained an ankle, pulled a muscle, what do you people say? Put an ice pack on it. One, ice helps to reduce inflammation, okay, which is a chemical irritant to nerves. So that can cause stimulate pain. But if we can reduce that, great. But what it also does is it slows down, all right, the transmission of those sensory potentials. Okay. So that's because it plays a role. All right. Remember, when we slow things down, all right, with, especially with diffusion, two things can affect the rate of diffusion. The larger, all right, your um, chemical gradient is or concentration gradient, and how much heat energy is involved. If you start to cool things down, molecules move slower. That means things will diffuse slower across, across those gates. Okay? So that's one of the nice things about ice. Ice is nice. How does a graded potential differ from, the, from an action potential in terms of the types of channels involved and where it occurs? All right. First of all, graded potentials. Receptive segment, which means it's in the dendrites. In the cell body, and that involves chemically gated channels, okay? Chemically gated channels. There are no, I hesitate to say this, right, but in general, there's no voltage gated channels in the receptive segment. And there are very few, okay? For our purposes, we don't really include those, okay? But chemically gated channels are in the receptive segment. When we talk about the action potential, all right, that is going to deal with voltage gated channels. And that is going to deal with the axon, okay? So 
keep that in mind. That's the difference, and you want to know the difference between graded potentials and action potentials in regards to where they occur and what type of channels are involved. Okay? All right. So after we have an action potential, we have this phenomenon called a refractory period. Okay? So this refractory period, right, is essential because we've got to reset it. So we can't initiate another action potential, right? In some cases we can, but in some cases we can't. And what I mean by that is there's two types of refractory periods, right? We have what's called an absolute refractory period and a relative refractory period, okay? So the absolute, I always remember it is absolutely no action potential will occur during this time. So that means no amount, no stimulus, doesn't matter how intense that stimulus is, nothing can create another action potential during this time. It's really short, in one millisecond, it's really fast, trust me, okay? Right? So that means, okay, that the sodium, and, and what causes the absolute refractory period, I, I said this earlier, all right, is when the inactivation gate is closed on the voltage gated sodium channels okay so even though the sodium channels are open okay it will be closed and in that inactivated state okay so they'll open at first obviously to let the sodium in and then they slam shut right the inactivated gate closes it's not open for anything okay so that is what's causing our absolute refractory period okay and once we get back to that negative 70 millivolt resting membrane potential, that's when the inactivation gate will open up. By then, the activation gate is closed. Okay? So keep in mind, that's, and I said this before, this is how, all right, we keep, all right, the action potential moving in one direction. It will not go back towards this receptive uh, segment. It's going to go down towards the synaptic knobs okay? because of the fact that we cannot stimulate all right, those voltage-gated sodium channels to open up. Okay? The only way that we can get that voltage-gated sodium channel inactivation gate to open up is to get back to that resting membrane potential of negative 70. Okay? All right. So the second type of refractory period right, it follows right after the absolute, right, it's relative, okay, so now we can get another action potential, right, but we need a really strong stimulus to occur, okay, right, you know, that negative 55 value, or, or excuse me, that positive 50 millivolt difference might not be enough, okay, we need something bigger, because guess what, Going back to this slide, nope, nope, this slide here, okay, all right, we are in the hyperpolarized state right now, okay, remember, what did I say, when we get to that negative 70 millivolt value, the inactivation gates will open up, okay? but we've overshot that, darn it, all right, not a problem, it's okay, all right, our membrane potential now is, say, negative 72 or negative 73. So instead of needing that positive 15 millivolt, right, uh, change, right, now we'll need maybe 18 millivolt change, all right? So we just need a stronger stimulus to get us back to that threshold value, okay? Because we're in that hyperpolarized state, which is taking us further away from that negative 55 value, okay? All right, so that's the absolute refractory period, and that's our relative refractory period. Okay, so keep in mind, which comes first? Absolute's always first. A comes before R in the alphabet. That's how I remembered it, okay? So it's really brief, but it's brief enough for, this, for, uh, for the neuron to kind of set itself back up, okay? And the, ref the relative refractory period, <clears throat> excuse me, occurs in the, when the cell is hyperpolarized. Okay, so instead of DV, like I said, that 15 millivolt value, you might need 18. You might need 20 millivolt value because we might be at a negative 75 membrane potential. 
We need to get to that negative 55. So we'll need a difference of 20 millivolts, okay? All right, so that's what we're showing here, our refractory period. So if you're looking, all right, you can see, all right, basically the same graph. So this is where we're going to see, all right, our, our relative refractory period in this area right here. All right. Oh, there we are. I was looking at the bottom of the page. <laughs> all right. So you can see the absolute, right, is from pretty much the onset of the first voltage-gated sodium channel opening up to where our um, resting membrane potential, right, to where the voltage-gated potassium channels, right, are opening up and are about to close here, okay? All right, what type of channels are sequentially open in the propagation of an, a uh, of an action uh, cut that off. In the propagation of the action depolarization, right? Voltage gated. Are we good with that? Voltage gated sodium channels are going to sequentially open up like dominoes falling, right? If I have 10, the first one opens up, and then the second one opens up just a little bit after that, and the third one opens up just a little bit after the second one had opened up, okay? So it's like dominoes falling, right? Or if you've ever watched, you've ever been to a stadium in which they do the wave, when people stand up, it's like that, you know? So as the waves come in closer to you and you start to stand up, that's what's going on here, right? It just kind of flows down the entire uh, conductive segment there, right? So in the propagation of repolarization, you got our potassium channels. So you no need to know which channels, right, are gonna be associated with which, okay? Voltage-gated sodium is depolarization, voltage-gated potassium is repol or, uh, yeah, repolarization. Okay, so this whole time I've been describing to you the phenomenon of what's called continuous conduction, okay? And that's when one gate opens up, then the next one opens up, and the next one, and the next one, and the next one, okay? And as that happens, we're dealing with all the adjacent regions here, and they open up sequentially. Okay? So this type of conduction, this whole time that I've been describing an action potential to you, occurs in unmyelinated axons, right? That means, right, if we're dealing with the peripheral nervous system, that means there's no Schwann cells on these axons. If we're dealing with the central nervous system, right, that means there's no illegal dendrocytes myelinating these axons, right? So continuous conduction occurs on unmyelinated axons, okay? Now we're going to get into saltatory conduction okay? same rules apply okay? we're going to deal we're going to be dealing with the same gates and whatnot there's a lot of information on the slide so I'm going to go through it nice and easy first of all important fact saltatory conduction occurs in myelinated axons okay myelinated axons give me a second I'm going to come right back to the slide okay good I'm going to come back to that side in a second. So here's an example of an unmyelinated axon, and this is continuous conduction. So you get one gate opening up, sodium flows in, then eventually potassium flows out. All right, and then the next voltage-gated sodium channel opens up, and so forth and so on, and it goes on down the line. So when we're dealing with the action potential in a myelinated cell, okay, we have to review a few things. First of all, remember these guys, the neurofibrillar node, or also known as the node of Ranvier, okay? That's the region of the axon that's not myelinated, okay? So those are the neurofibrillar nodes or the nodes of Ranvier, okay? And then these here are our Schwann cells or, or neural lemocyte. I just wanted to review that with you so you know what I'm talking about, okay? So our action potential, and I've seen this asked on a test before, only occurs at the neural fibril nodes, okay? That means where there's no myelin, that's where you're gonna get your action potential, okay? Because that's where you're gonna find most of your voltage-gated sodium channels. I'm gonna come back to this slide here, zoom in. That's where, what we're seeing here, okay? Now, Understand, it used to be, you know, it's funny, you know, a lot has changed, but it used to be thought, okay, 
that these signals jumped from node to node. That's what was taught to me when I was taking this class. Okay? Oh, no, that's not the case. Okay? So we find out what will happen, and I'll explain it to you, is that, yes, the action potential occurs here, all right, but it still goes down the axon. Okay? It doesn't jump from node to node. All right? And I'll explain that here on this slide. Okay? So here's what happened at the nodes, the nodes of Ranvier, the neural, uh, neurofibrillar nodes, right? Sodium is going to enter the cell, okay, at those places there. It's going to enter the cell. And here's the thing. It's going to enter the cell. And it's going to create this huge positive charge, okay? And what will, it will do is that huge positive charge will start to travel down, right? It'll start to travel down the inside of the axon. Well, guess what? Remember what happened to our graded potentials, right? They encountered resistance. Okay? They encountered resistance, right, from the plasma, uh, excuse me, from the cytosol. You have all, remember, cytosol is like goo, right? It's easier to swim through water than it is through jello, right? So imagine that our active potential is a swimmer. And they're trying to swim through jello, okay? But every time they get to a neurofibril node, to get a power boost and then push through again, okay? So as that action potential is traveling through the myelinated area here, it starts to become weaker and weaker and weaker. But then when it gets to the new neurofibril node, another action potential boost occurs there because that's where all those sodium, those voltage-gated sodium gates are. So it triggers the opening of those gates. Sodium floods in, it boosts it, and it shoots it through. And then it, it starts to swim through the next all right, uh, Schwann cell area. It becomes weaker and weaker. And then, bam, it hits another neurofibril node. That's what we're seeing here. So we're not seeing all right, these action potentials jump from node to node. It all stays inside the axon. Right? So starting off with the neurofibril node, same story. Sodium enters the node, right? and it does it fast. Okay? It starts to travel through the area of the axon that's myelinated. But as it does, it becomes weaker and weaker because it's, it's experiencing that resistance from all the stuff that's in your cytosol, right? So it becomes weaker and weaker until it gets to the next neurofibril node, and then it opens up another voltage-gated sodium channel, and bam, all this sodium floods in, okay? And then that charges up the action potential again. Okay, and then it pushes it down to the next node. So just kind of think, if you play video games, it's like a, like a I don't know, you get a power up, <laughs> all right? That's the best way I can describe it. You get a power up, and you know, and you, and you go faster. If anyone ever played, a, what was it, Mario Karts? You know, so you're familiar with that, all right? So when you're driving in your car, and you get, I, I don't, I've only played it a couple times, whatever that power up is, and you get a power boost, like a turbocharge, a mushroom. <laughs> yes, yeah, all right? So that's what occurs until you get to the next neurofibril node. You start to slow down a little bit, then you get another power up, and bam, it shoots you down. Okay? So, a couple things about saltatory conduction. One, it's much faster than continuous conduction, and it uses less ATP. That's huge. Okay? That's huge. Because those sodium potassium ion pumps don't have to keep burning through that ATP, all right, to generate that concentration gradient, okay? All right. Um, finally, in the myelinated area, remember what I told you, fat is an energy source. It's a cushioning uh, 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 function. It insulates. And that insulation, all right, prevents those ions from leaving, all right, the, the actual plasma membrane, the axolemma. lemma. They only have one direction that they can go, and that's down the axon, okay? That helps to promote that action potential, okay? Every time I teach this segment, it always blows my mind that when I was learning this, that I used to think that it jumped node to node. Yeah, I know. And I think at the time, it's just easier to kind of get people to understand that. 
this is a little bit different, but if it wasn't for video games, I wouldn't be able to uh, explain it as eloquently. All right, here's that picture. So here, just a, okay, quick review. You can see, right, here's our action potential at the neurofibrillary node, right? Sodium enters, potassium leaves, and bang, shoots off our action potential. It starts to go down the plasma, uh, excuse me, the axon. It becomes weaker and weaker until it experiences or, or encounters its next neurofibril node. Bam, it gets a recharge and it shoots it down until the next. And that just happens and it keeps going. And it, it allows, all right, for the quickness, all right, of saltatory conduction. So how does conduction of an action potential an unmyelinated axon and myelinated axon differ, okay? It's pretty much what we just discussed, right? So in an unmyelinated axon, it's going to encounter continuous conduction, okay? And all those sodium, those voltage-gated sodium channels will open sequentially, okay? When we're dealing here in, in a myelinated axon, right, then we'll get only the opening of those voltage-gated sodium and potassium channels in the, at the neural fibril node, right? The ones that are underneath, right, the, the myelin, right, the Schwann cell, right, that's so well insulated by the myelin, it makes it very difficult, right, for, so, for sodium and potassium to, to diffuse across the axial lemma, okay? All right, ooh, we're getting into the fun stuff. I love it. I don't know what it is. I, I think every class I say, ooh, this is my favorite part, you know, but I really like the transmissive segment. One, because we're done talking about sodium and potassium for a while. We get to talk about calcium. Calcium's cool, all right? Um, but it's just, it's a little bit different, and it's just, I think it's a little bit easier to understand. And, and this part carries over into Chapter 10, muscles, okay? So really, really try to grasp this, because when we, Start going over chapter 10, all right? This makes it a little bit easier. Okay, so, um, do I have, oh, I do, okay. So our action potential starts to travel down, all right, the axon, it comes all the way down the teledendron and eventually hits synaptic knob, okay? And at the synaptic knob, we have a couple structures, okay? We have our voltage-gated calcium channels, and we have our calcium ion pumps, okay? So when the cell is at rest, nothing's going on, our calcium ion pumps are pumping calcium out of the cell, okay? So calcium is in higher concentration, all right, in the interstitial fluid than it is on the inside of the cell. Okay, keep that in mind. In a resting neuron, okay, when it's not doing anything, more calcium is outside the cell than inside the cell. Just like sodium, just like chloride, okay? They're in higher concentration outside the cell. So now, our action potential races down and it's going to open up our very first voltage-gated calcium channel, okay? So, when that happens, our voltage-gated calcium channel opens up, right? And calcium, obviously, is going to diffuse, which means it's going to go from an area of higher concentration to lower concentration. It goes from outside the cell to inside the cell, right? And inside the cell, you have your synaptic vesicles. Those are those little bubbles that are floating around with your neurotransmitter, okay? So what happens is, and I love this part, Calcium is going to glom onto, it's going to bind to these proteins on the outside of those synaptic vesicles, okay? And what happened, this is cool, okay? Calcium is a cation, it's positively charged. So I'm going to come back to the slide. All this calcium, you can see, it starts to glom onto these synaptic vesicles. And so they coat the synaptic vesicles, but guess what? They're coating the synaptic vesicles with the positive charge. But what's the charge of the inside of the plasma membrane normally in a resting uh, um, neuron? Negative. What do opposites do? They attract. Love it. How cool is that? The inside of the plasma membrane here by the synaptic cleft, all right, is negative. 
So these positively charged cations glom onto these synaptic vesicles and that, and that there's an attraction there. So these synaptic vesicles are attracted there to the plasma membrane, they fuse with the, uh, with the synaptic, uh, excuse me, with the plasma membrane through exocytosis, right? They fuse and they release their contents, all right, which is the neurotransmitter, all right? They fuse with the plasma membrane, do exocytosis, they expel their contents into the synaptic cleft. Okay? And that neurotransmitter diffuses across the synaptic cleft. And it goes to the whatever the other structure is. It could be muscle, it could be a gland, it could be another neuron. Okay? Those neurotransmitters cross over and they look for the receptor. Right, of whatever that other structure is on the other side of the cleft. And they will bind to the receptor, and then it'll trigger those if uh, the, the channels to open up, okay? So we'll talk more about what happens, and especially when we get into muscles, because we'll talk, but basically, all right, that neurotransmitter diffuses across, right, and it's in search of these postsynaptic receptors there, okay? All right, so one of the things you need to know or should know is that your neurons aren't specific to one type of neurotransmitter. They can make more than one type, okay? But only one type can be released at a time, okay? Transmissive segments, not that, it's not as complicated as all the other stuff. <clears throat> Has anyone ever heard of a calcium channel blocker, rapamil? Okay, I doubt that any of you would. Well, unless you're describing it or dealing with it, because no one in here, I'm assuming, has a heart problem. But verapamil is a calcium channel blocker, and it's for people that have heart issues. And you'll learn in 211 that calcium channels are, play a huge role in the contraction of your heart. All right, so if you are able to block calcium channels, all right, from calcium diffusing down, then you can block the, the, the signals for contractions of the heart, or slow it down, I should say. You don't want to stop it, that'd be bad. Verapamil would never last very long on the market if it was killing everybody, all right? But what it does is it helps to slow the heart down a little bit. Calcium channel block. All right, so that's what this picture here is showing us. Right, so our calcium, uh, the action potential comes down, opens up our voltage-gated calcium channels here. Calcium spills into the cell. All right, it gloms on to or binds on to the proteins here on these synaptic vesicles. Right, causes these synaptic vesicles to migrate towards synaptic cleft. Right, they fuse with the plasma membrane, exocyte, exocytose. All right. Your neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft, it diffuses across the cleft and looks for the receptors here, all right, on the uh, gated channels, okay, on the other side of the cleft. And then we'll visit what happens there, especially in muscles. What is the sequence of events from the arrival of an action potential at the synaptic knob until the release of neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft? Voltage gated, that's what I just said. So that's pretty much what I just thought. I'm not going to read that off. That's what I just read. Okay. Um, this slide here just kind of, where are we going? There we go. Basically, if you want to take a few moments to kind of write some of this down here, this kind of explains the difference between a graded potential and an action potential. Okay. So again, graded potentials deal with chemically gated channels, okay? Action potentials will deal with voltage gated channels, okay? Graded potentials are in the receptive segments. Action potentials are in the conductive segments, right? <laughs> Excuse me. My allergy has been killing me today, guys, so I apologize. I didn't take my Zyrtec. Okay, so... When we're dealing with graded potentials, 
They can either generate EPSPs or IPSPs. So that can be, if we're generating EPSPs, that could be a positive all right, change. Or if we're ge generating IPSPs, that could be a negative change in the charge across the plasma membrane. When we're dealing all right, with action potentials, we'll have depolarization, sodium in, repolarization, potassium out. Okay. Um, graded potentials are going to be local. All right. Action potentials are going to, once activated, will propagate or travel down the entire length of the axon all the way to the synaptic knob. Right. Action potentials are ruled by the all or none law. So either you hit the threshold or you don't. Right. And when you do, this thing is jumping into action and it's not stopping. Right. We're talking about graded potentials. Right. If you get a weak stimulus, you're going to get a weak response. If you get a strong stimulus, you're going to get a stronger response. Right. So the larger potential change means we have a larger stimulus occurring. So these are this slide here really kind of breaks it down for you to really understand the difference. Okay. And uh, and there's some similarities, but really. All right, what makes a graded potential a graded potential and what makes an action potential an action potential? So if you can understand everything on here, all right, pretty well, then I'd say you're doing pretty good, okay? Um, this will make it a little bit easier. Right, any questions so far? I always feel like, it's okay if you tell my other section this, I always feel like I can move through this material it takes me, I, I don't know if I'm just rambling in my other classes, but I get through the material quicker with you folks. I always feel like these recordings are better than my other recordings. Don't tell them that, though. Okay. <clears throat> I've seen this asked as a test question, so I bring it up only because you really need to understand how do we make an action potential fast, or I shouldn't say action potential, a nerve signal. How do we make the nerve signal faster? If you want more water, okay, coming out of your pipe or out of your faucet, put a bigger pipe in there, okay? You get more water through bigger pipes than smaller pipes. So, same thing when we're dealing with, all right, how fast our action potential occurs. The larger the diameter of an axon, the quicker, all right, the action potential. We already talked about myelination. Right, myelinated nerve, ner excuse, nerves, myelinated neurons, okay, conduct the action potential faster than unmyelinated. Okay, saltatory conduction is faster than continuous conduction. Okay, so big nerves that are myelinated will transmit faster nerve signals, quicker action potential. Okay, okay, so the bigger the nerve. Less resistance, easier for the signal to get down. Okay, and we already talked about what happens at the myelinated uh, nerves. Okay, myelin will insulate, makes it tougher for sodium potassium to diffuse in and out of the cell. Right, but it occurs between the nodes there, the neurofibril nodes. Okay, I've seen that asked on the test question before. So don't. Miss it. Okay? It'll make you sad. No, you won't. <laughs> but not. Okay. Um, just a couple different types uh, when we're talking about our nerve fibers. All right. There's group A, group B, and group C. All right. So these guys, the group A, are the big, big, big ones. Look at the speed on this one. 150 meters per second. All right. Compared to group B which is 15 meters per second, compared to group C, which is one meter per second, okay? So group A are the largest, and they're myelinated, okay? So this is gonna be your somatic sensory neurons, where that's good, somatic sensory neurons are the neurons that we can consciously uh, sense or perceive, all right? And also, all of our somatic motor neurons, those are gonna be all the, the, the nerves that innervate our skeletal muscles. And it's good. We want that to be fast because 
When we get to reflexes, it'll make sense. Right? Reflexes could be life or death. We need them to occur quickly. So we're going to use the big guns, the group A fibers. Okay? So group um, B and group C, they're obviously going to be smaller, all right? And they can be, not all of them, all right, are going to be unmyelinated. Group C, this is an interesting one because this is what your nociceptors are. Those are your pain receptors. So has anyone ever been doing something? Uh, the example I usually use is hammering a nail into a piece of wood and then you accidentally hit your thumb. Or if you hurt yourself, have you ever just kind of shook your, your hand? You're like, ah, oh, dang, that hurts. It's called the gate theory. And what you're doing is when you're shaking your hand or whatever to try to make the pain decrease, right? You're stimulating your group A fibers. What's going on is that information is flooding your spinal cord, all right? It's flooding the spinal cord at the area where the group C fibers usually enter in to try to transmit their information. But since group A is quicker and bigger, and it sends all of its information, it essentially blocks out the group C pain fibers from sending their information to the spinal cord and getting it up to your brain. So kind of, it's like it's like somebody that's blocking the doorway. You're trying to leave the room and I'm blocking the doorway. I'm like, you're not getting out of here, you know? All right, that's what the group A fibers are doing to block the, the group C fibers when, when, you, when you hurt yourself. All right. Um, frequency of the action potentials, all right? You're into um, physics with wave, um, I'm just going to say wave theory, it's not a theory, uh, but with, with the physics of, of how uh, waves travel, all right, we, you discuss frequency. That's going to be how many action potentials that we're going to see per second. Oh, I heard that. Should we know the times for each group or just, just the general idea? Just to know which ones are faster, okay? All right. So... What I said before is we cannot increase, you got it, you cannot increase, all right, the actual change in the voltage across the plasma membrane, right, depending on what's entering. But when we increase the firing rates of our action potentials, we can actually increase the strength here. All right, so example would be, we'll, we'll learn this a little bit more in detail. Right, white lights. Okay, when you walk from a dimly lit movie theater out into the bright afternoon sun, right, you're bombarding your photoreceptors, right, with that light information. Okay, so what happens is you're going to increase the action potential frequency. Okay, it's still going to travel at a constant. Right, speed, but you'll just generate more frequencies of those action potentials. Right? Same thing here when we're talking about muscles, and we'll get into this part in a little bit more detail in chapter 10. Right? But when you're trying to maintain a contraction or recruit muscles to do a certain maneuver, exercise, um, the more nerves that fire right, at a faster frequency, we're going to be able to stimulate, or we call it recruitment, right, more muscle fibers to increase the amount of muscle tension or muscle strength. Right? So if you want to jump higher, you just need to obviously train for it. But if you're just kind of doing it kind of half-heartedly, right, you're not utilizing all the muscle fibers. So if I want to recruit more muscle fibers so I can jump higher, and I need to stimulate more muscle fibers through more action potentials through more faster frequency firing, okay? And then finally, all right, we can change up our neurotransmitters because our neurotransmitter, the type of neurotransmitter, if we change that up, all right, can actually influence, all right, will be influenced by that uh, frequency of the action potentials that are being fired. That's one way that you can change, you have a neuron that has two different types of neurotransmitters, right? How you're able to stimulate the release of one neurotransmitter over the other is if you increase frequency of the action potentials, then that will stimulate a different neurotransmitter. 
right. Um, hold on one second. Okay, okay. Right, I just want to see what I've done in here. It's been a while since I've used the slideshow, guys. Bear with me. Okay. So neurotransmitters. Let's talk about them a little bit. Okay. There is over a hundred different types of neurotransmitters, and we have to go through them all tonight. Okay? I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> all right. We're not going to go through them all tonight. All right? We're only going to go through the ones that I think are important. They're all at, named after me. We're just going to go over a few, okay? Because there's tons out there. Um, and if you're planning on going to pharmacology, then maybe you can learn a little bit more. But that's for another class for another time. So we all know that the neurotransmitters are stored in the synaptic vesicles, and they're made right, by the neuron, packaged up by the neuron in the synaptic vesicles. And they're left there in, in wait for a nerve signal to um, come down or an action potential to come down right, and trigger the voltage-gated calcium channels to open up. Okay? So we, we've all seen right, all of this right, before. Okay? So this is basically saying, you know, the synaptic vesicles release the neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft, they bind onto the receptor, all right, on the target cell, and they're going to initiate some sort of physiological response. Right? And we actually get to see that in a little bit more detail in Chapter 10. All right, we're going to learn how specifically acetylcholines, all right, the neurotransmitter that stimulates our skeletal muscles, how that is going to affect its physiological response on the skeletal muscle, okay? I know that you guys are anxiously awaiting. Fun stuff. All right. So speaking of acetylcholine, right, neurotransmitters, it's kind of a binary uh, um, situation with neurotransmitters, right? And what that means is it's either going to turn something on or turn something off, okay? Some neurotransmitters can just do one. Some can do both. Acetylcholine is an example of that. It can be either excitatory or inhibitory. Okay? So acetylcholine, we'll, we'll talk more. I'm not going to get into it, all right? but we'll talk more about it in uh, Chapter 10. All right, the next class are going to be what we call our monoamines. Right? And you've heard of some of these. Dopamine, okay? Those, that is in the classification of the catecholamine. Right? which is basically these all come from amino acids. Okay, so this classification uh, of neurotransmitter in monoamines are going to be essentially from amino acids. More popular one, the catecholamines. Uh, you'll see those uh, um, in the adrenal gland. Okay, we'll talk more about that next semester. All right, serotonin. Uh, this makes me sad because... I actually had to, I was doing a DOT, CDL, DOT medical um, examination on a patient today, and they have, um, they were taking, um, uh, what's the name of it, nortriptyline. Does anyone know what nortriptyline is? An antidepressant. Specifically, it's what they call a tricyclic TCA, which is the first generation. Actually, nortriptyline was made in 1963. Which has been around for a while. This patient had been on it since 1984, and they take it for fibromyalgia. Helps with some of their symptoms. They've done pretty well. But unfortunately, because of its side effects, it's not. Uh, it's not. You cannot take it. To have a CDL. You can't. Has anyone here heard of Chantex? It's the smoking cessation drug. You know. Does anyone know what <laughs> one of the the predominant side effects for Chantex? Yeah, crazy dreams is one, but there's another one. Suicidal ideations. Yeah, let me tell you something. You don't want your truck drivers having suicidal ideations when they're driving on I-85, okay? Yeah, they got enough ideations on I-85 just to stay alive on that road, all right? So it's one of those drugs where you cannot, if you're on it, you can't take it, okay? Certain classifications of drugs you can't take. I'm trying to remember why you brought this up. Anyways, all right? Um, oh, classifications. PCA. Serotonin is uh, serotonin is a second generation drug. All right, it's a serotonin. Uh, I was thinking of uh, not a second classification. Serotonin reminded me of SSRIs, and we talked about that I think earlier on in the semester. The selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Chapter seven. That's right. Okay. 
Anyways, I digress. The next uh, chemical class are the uh, amino acids, and we're all familiar with amino acids, right? We don't make you memorize all the amino acids, okay, that, that are found in the body. There's about 20 of them, okay? But some of these here, right, glutamate, glycine, and GABA, right, some of those you'll see more, more so in the central nervous system, okay? Um, but for this class, you don't need to know. The only thing I really want you to know are the four uh, chemical classes. And then finally, we have our neuropeptides. Right? These guys are just chains of amino acids that are strung along. You've heard of endorphins before. right? That's the feel-good chemical that your body releases. Actually, uh, you release it in significant amounts when you're crying. So I've had patients break down and cry, and I tell them, let it out. Is get your cry on because you're releasing endorphins and it helps make you feel better. Right? Substance P is is a sub is a substance, huh? But it's uh, you find it in the pain response. Right? In Kefalons, that's another one that is um, a feel good uh, chemical. But just keep in mind, these are the main all right the main chemical classes for our neurotransmitters that I want you to know. And all right, listen, I've gone over a little bit and I hate to do that sometimes. We only have eight more slides, so what I'll do is stop here. We'll knock. We'll finish this up. I might. Yeah, I'm going to stop here, and um, we'll finish this up. How about in lab, All right? Today in lab. Sorry, guys. I'm just dying today. I just feel like I'm just going to let's just label the upper extremity and call it an evening. If you guys don't mind, <laughs> do it. We're on time. We're doing great. But I want to finish up this chapter, so we'll be on time. All right, guys. So let's take a